I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar for Simulation CFD. We have John Wild. He's based out of the UK, and he will be talking about performing free surface analyses. You know, we have some best practices, a couple examples, and, and a lot of videos to share so that you understand what you can do and how to do it. Just as a reminder, all, a lot of this material is available to download from Box. So if you look at that link up above in the right-hand corner, it says oddvest.box.com slash CFD12, because this is the 12th CFD webinar that we have done. So next slide, John. There we go. Uh, just as a reminder, these are all of our previous topics and some notes about where we announce. We talk about this every week, so I'm not going to go in much detail. Uh, you can definitely see where the more interesting topics are in terms of the views that we have on YouTube. So I encourage you to check uh, those out as well as all the others. In terms of knowledge base articles for the month of January, these are the ones that we made public. These are all generated from cases that we have with, with everybody. And one that I want to point out here towards the bottom, this is actually an article that John wrote on valve analyses to match test data. This really captures a lot of our best practices on doing complex valves to get good uh, like CV and KV values. So most likely this will be a great starting point for a future webinar. Um, so as in the link down below, this brings you to an article that I actually, or a page that I manage that covers a lot of the highest used or views troubleshooting articles. So if you're stuck somewhere, go there first, and that might actually point you in the right direction. Thank you, Royce, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess I'm kind of really excited about this presentation. I, I've wanted to talk about free services for a while, and um, it just looks so cool as well. I mean, I, I think from about halfway through the presentation, it's pretty much all kind of visual and videos. So once you've kind of got through the setup process, things get pretty... Um, Beautiful, I guess. Um, so initially, I want to talk about why we're, why we're doing this. Um, then again, like most of these best practices presentations, we'll go through the process in CFD. Um, so you know, from CAD um, through to results. Um, and then we'll talk about some results. I'll do that live probably. And then we'll talk about some pitfalls and limitations and places where we could go wrong. And then we'll look at other applications. So I'm really focusing on one model, but then we'll kind of try to talk about um, everywhere where we could apply this. I guess you'll see actually on the first image there we've got a, a kind of tsunami simulation. So, I mean, initially that might get you thinking, you know, we can kind of go from really kind of small type of um, models to big kind of city size analyses. So, you know, like most of the things in CFD, there's no real kind of limitation in size or scope. Um, the webinar has been requested so many times um, in our feedback, and I personally wanted to present it as well. Um, we do have a guide um, that's already online, and I thought I'd just briefly show it, actually. Um, it's pretty good, but um, it just doesn't kind of, it wasn't as kind of systematic as I think I really want to see if I had a guide myself. Um, and it doesn't cover all the different applications that we could cover. So I thought I'd um, do this instead and try to kind of encapsulate everything in one place. So just to take you through the process, we're going to simply, um, we're going to analyze, analyze a pretty simple model um, that actually ends up looking pretty cool. So we've got a box uh, on the left-hand side. We've got an inlet. We've got a nice um, inlet extrusion. So we have fairly developed flow entering, um, and we're going to have a jet firing from the left through um, the void inside and striking the wall on the right, filling up the basin, and then flowing out of the outlet at the bottom there. So always in these analyses, analyses, free surface analyses, we need to make sure that we model um, anywhere where we know there's going to be a fluid, and also we need to model any kind of area of void where the fluid might pass into. Um, we, we need to mesh both of those. So moving into CFT, uh, we have our external solid, and obviously because we capped the model off, we had our inlet and outlet extrusions, um, CFD is going to automatically fill that volume with a fluid for us. Um, and we're actually going to be injecting water into the left-hand side here. So what we do first in CFD, I generally would select everything and make it solid to kind of make sure I capture any small parts if there are any. And then I'd go in and select my fluid volumes, which I was pretty sure about. So I've got my inlet and outlet, 
and my internal fluid and all of those are going to be assigned water for now. Um, one point to avoid is to not ever assign a gas material um, to any parts. I mean, to, when you first look at this, it makes sense to give the box air and the inlet extrusion water, but the free surface um, model doesn't work like that, and CFD will throw up an error that we have two dissimilar fluids touching. So we make everything water, and um, I'll explain why a little further down the line. The branding conditions are pretty straightforward, much like any you know, basic analysis. We've got um, a flow rate on the inlet. Here I've got two meters a second. Um, we could have any kind of um, inlet condition we wanted to, mass flow rate, velocity. Um, and then on our outlet, we just got a zero pressure. And we don't need to worry in these types of analyses that the flow might recirculate or um, not quite fill that zero pressure as it exits. So it's probably not going to fill that drain entirely. It might go down one side as it exits, and that's totally OK. Initial conditions are something we only need to do um, if we have a body of fluid initially. So generally, these might be a tank draining analysis, or perhaps if we're looking at a mixing application where we have a, a tank that's totally full of water, um, we would assign a height of fluid to that volume. And that would mean that then it's totally full of whatever fluid we happen to be modeling, in this case, water. Um, with our analysis, we don't have anything that's already full of liquid, um, so we don't have any initial conditions set at all. Um, I'll mention that a bit more. I'm going to talk about a weir very briefly later, and um, I'll be able to show you exactly how and where we would apply that. Let me move on to the meshing. Um, which is pretty critical with these types of models. Um, you can see on the bottom right there how I've meshed this model. So I've uh, manual meshing is probably the best way to go uh, for these types of analyses. Generally, we actually find that models can run faster with a finer mesh um, to a point. But I um, ignored all that. I use an automatic mesh, um, and what I have done is use two regions, and they're uniform. So I have got a manual mesh in the two regions where I know the gel is going to pass from one side to the other and then also where it's going to pull along the bottom. Um, there's some rules of thumb to kind of abide by. Um, across the width of a jet, we want to make sure we've got at least five or six elements. Um, it doesn't matter the size of the jet, as big or small as it is, that's a very definite minimum. And then we need a fine mesh wherever we have this, the free surface, so the edge of the jet, and then the fluid as it falls down the back wall and along the bottom. Uh, then we move into the solver controls, and this is where we actually enable the free surface. So within solve, we go to physics and free surface. And the only thing, if your analysis is static, the only thing you need to do is turn on gravity. And here, um, gravity is acting in our negative y direction, so we've got a value of minus 1. There's some additional solver controls, so if we might be... Um, moving our box, so perhaps we're looking at a lorry that's containing uh, fuel that's breaking, um, there might be some kind of seismic event or something of sloshing, something that makes our um, box move, then we would start to look at um, adding additional acceleration components. Um, you may also notice that Advection Scheme 1 is, a, is um, selected by default, and um, we should always leave that as default. It's the the only advection scheme to use for free surface models. Um, I thought I'd also add a little box in the corner there. In fact, I'll be honest, Royce added a little box in the corner. Um, just to mention where we should use advection scheme one. So free surfaces are critical, and um, surface uh, resistances and some full motion models as well. Um, and it's pretty important. This next slide has quite a lot of information, um, which I apologize for. But within the solve window, um, there's actually not too much to do. So as soon as we switch free surface on, CFD is going to choose a time step for us, and it always chooses the point zero one of a second. Um, when we run our model, after a couple of iterations, CFD um, will start to scan the free surface as it propagates through the model, and it will adjust that time step to make sure that we're only moving one element per time step. Um, obviously, that can change as the analysis progresses. Now, we found that setting a stop time is often ineffective, um, purely because this time step can constantly change. So what we tend to do is just set a large number of time steps. 
you'll find uh, that three inner iterations is a really good starting point. Um, sometimes more can be useful, but we very rarely would ever uh, reduce that value. So I would always say just start with three. Um, we can save our intervals. As you'll see, um, with when I explain the analysis and how I set it up, um, well, I, I set up results to save every 0.1 of a second. Um, and it ran for about five seconds, as you can see. Um, so I gathered about 50 time steps, which is good for an animation. Um, and it's not too many to fill my hard drive. It took about 20 gigabytes of data, I think, to capture that fully. Um, something else that's also worth bearing in mind is instead of just running purely seconds, we could click the small table um, just here. So we could say fill a tank over time and then have some other kind of effect happening and actually focus our save time steps around a, an event that happens later on in our analysis. Okay, and before we um, move on to looking at some results, I'm just going to pass you back to Royce briefly, who's going to explain um, an analysis that he ran recently too. Okay, so let me share my screen here. Okay, John, do you see it? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So this is a model that actually came from a, a journal article that was published in 2003. It's a very simple free surface model. Basically, it's a flow over rectangular weir. And really, I, you know, I, I found this model right about when we released the free surface approach so that I could start exploring some of the settings and, and see what really happens. So the model is basic. The flow comes in on the right-hand side and then flows over the weir, comes down, and then eventually works its way down through the outlet. So just as John talked about previously, the setup is very simple. We have you know, a solid enclosure. We have water on the inside. I've also set up a singular volume right here just to capture where I'm going to assign where the fluid starts, which is set up with the height of fluid initial condition. In terms of boundary conditions, I do have a slip symmetry uh, within the actual uh, midplane of this model, so it's really twice the size. And then I have a pressure at the outlet right here, and then a volume flow rate coming in on the, the inlet side. All of this I ran with two different mesh sizes, uh, completely manual and defined throughout everywhere. It's not very strategic, more just a quick approach. So I had a 20 millimeter size, a 10 millimeter size, and then to kind of nail in why we start with three iterations, I ran this with one, two, three, five, and 10, and let that go from there. So within that paper, it actually does publish some CFD results as well as some basic uh, hand calculations and what to expect. And this is the general output from that tool. Is If you look at this, the dotted line, this is that three iteration with the 20 millimeter, so sort of my, my rougher mesh. All the rest are done with the 10 millimeter. And what you see here are these three lines that basically, you know, the red lines are the sort of hand calculation expectation. And there's actually three lines in here that represent the 3, 5, and 10 that, for the most part, overlap throughout the entire analysis. The two lines on the top here, the blue and the yellow, actually represent two iterations and one iteration. And you can really see how that starts to fall apart in terms of the expected result. So that's why, with these analyses, stick with our defaults for the three iterations. You know, we've seen that be the best fit for, for pretty much, uh, I would say, 80 or 90 percent of our models. Sometimes you might see a need for more iterations if you start having some motion in there, you know, some um, some mixing models, things like that. Okay. Um, from there, I'm going to hand that back to John. If there's some questions on this model and, and what I did, I can go into it in more detail. But we'll save that for the Q&A section later. Okay, John, I will cool, pass you the ball again, so it's all yours. Okay, please shout if you can't see my screen, otherwise I'll keep going. I see it, so go okay, for so it. Okay, so what I want to do now, um, 
let's just start to look at the results. Um, this is the base result of a, a point in time um, before the five seconds was finished. Um, to show the results at any point, you can right click on every surface and we can right click on it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, it's unlike Royce's model where he had height of fluid. Um, we don't have that. We just have a single inlet and a single outlet. And then within the results, just to kind of show you really how we can how we can look at these different results. If we do a right click, we can take a look at free surface. So this is, I think, the last time step. Yeah. So this is after five seconds. Um, uh, so once we've got the um, free surface on screen, obviously we can we can take a look and understand what's happening. Um, what I tend to do is take a look, uh, right click on it, and shade the mesh. So this is actually shading the mesh only on the free surface. Um, so we see that we've captured these elements through the inlet. Um, and we can see that the mesh is actually pretty coarse as it's starting to overflow the top of the basin. And this can mean that um, we're actually losing uh, information. So if we don't have a fine enough mesh, we can actually lose fluid. It's important to make sure we do have things. And I'll show you a comparison between a, a good and poor mesh um, and how that can seriously impact the results in a second. The other thing I wanted to show whilst we're here is that we have all these different time steps saved and we can simply just click on one and it will take us back to a different point in time. So this is when it's partially filled. So you can get a really good idea of what's happening over time. Um, you can also write and animate. I'm not going to do this because it takes a minute or two to load everything in. Um, but if we press animate it would capture whatever I have on screen and animate it over time. Okay, so moving back to the PowerPoint, and I do have some animations coming up pretty soon of exactly this. Um, I just want to talk about some pitfalls and areas where it's easy to go wrong. Um, really, the thing I can think of, because the setups are pretty simple, is meshing. Um, we do need to make sure that we have five or six elements across a jet or channel of fluid, anything really. Um, wherever we know there's going to be a free surface, so where the, where essentially in reality we have the fluid and gas interfacing, but in CFE we just have the top of the fluid. Um, we need to make sure we have a very fine mesh there. And like I said, fluid can disappear if we don't have sufficient mesh capture below. So I ran this model twice um, in the end. You'll see on the left hand side, that's my um, original attempt. And this is pretty much with the mesh as I showed you before. So I had two um, small regions. And you'll see that I didn't fully capture um, what's happening on the real. I just didn't have sufficient mesh and the fluid was essentially vanishing. So I ran it again um, with a fine mesh on the rear wall, as you can see on the right hand side. And that changed the results significantly. I think probably the mesh propagated out in the air a little more as well, and it helped to really capture that um, jet correctly. So it just kind of shows how important meshing is. And we can see here as well, you know, if we were just looking at the results on a cut plane, if you take a look at the rear plane, um, this is the, the same point in time, and the results are wild different. I'll try it now. Um, hopefully it'll look okay um, over the internet. But you can see the difference over time. Um, the, the animation on the right looks like what we'd expect the basin is filling up. Um, on the left, flow's disappearing and the basin just isn't filling up like it should be. There are some limitations. Um, really because of how we model the free surface. So we're not strictly modeling um, water, and we're certainly modeling water uh, with zero pressure on the surface and a void above it. So although we can model jets like I have, pretty large ones, we can't really look at spray or anything where there's going to be any kind of atomization. Um, we're not going to model air resistance or surface tension. So anything with kind of splashing and droplets probably isn't going to be applicable. But anything more larger kind of bolts of water and um, it's pretty perfectly suitable. And on that point, I just want to 
we've got a few applications um, just to give you an idea really of how and where we can use this. So I said before I, I just wanted to look at a wheel or dam break. I mean Royce has pretty much done the same thing but you know, on the right hand side here we have a height of fluid assigned. So this is our full kind of lake at the top of a dam. Um, then we've got a couple of holes that appear and the water's going to pour through. So over time, unless we fill that volume at the top, it will empty out. Um, a lot of the time in analysis of weirs or dams, we might look at forces. Um, so we can do that uh, just on the same model as I had before. Um, I just wanted to kind of show a quick comparison. So we can have a look at the model on the left um, with the jet, you know, progressing across. And on the right hand side, we can the pressure on the wall. Um, that should be pretty realistic. And we can take the wall forces as well. So we should be able to measure um, what's happening to the solid surrounding structures. And then I guess we get slightly more advanced. Again, I'm going to do this on the same model as I had before, but we can look at tank sloshing. So instead of having a static model, it might start to move. Uh, but like I said before, it could be just simply a truck braking, a seismic event, anything where the analysis is non-static. So we would revisit the um, search window, and instead of just having gravity, um, we would turn on also a component direction or multiples. Um, and here you can see I've got an acceleration spike. So what's going to happen is my jet is from one side to the other, but then my container is going to move. Um, so the jet should move, you know, uh, in the opposite direction. So I'll just play that now. I'll probably let this run a couple of times so you can um, get an idea of what's happening in case it's a little bit choppy. Um, so the jet tries to kind of propagate and put it forward. It's a good chance, really. Um, the whole assembly moves to the side and then comes to rest again so the water gets pushed on the side and falls down again. Uh, and you see again, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a, a few kind of areas that don't look as realistic as we'd expect. And again, that's just because of the meshing. So I could have meshed this to a much greater degree and probably got a more accurate result. I actually grabbed these images um, of a boat uh, moving from an article that's already on our knowledge network. Um, but it's just another way of looking at the surface. If we had a boat that was moving through water, um, like you know any kind of um, aerodynamics analysis, um, we generally would keep that boat still and would move the boat around. So here we've got lots of kind of nested volumes within CAD. Um, the bottom volume or volumes will have a height of fluid assigned, so they're going to be full to represent the top will just be empty. Um, and we generally would have flow entering and exiting, which is kind of a no-no in any other type of analysis, but it really works well with these types. Um, so then we should see the water flowing past the boat. And to give you an idea what that looks like. So you'll see on the top there um, is essentially the boat moving through water. And again, we can look at wall forces and a really good idea of what's being to this chair. And on the bottom right is kind of a nice weight region that I thought I'd share. And then we can start to move into even more complex motion. So um, we could look at free surfaces combined um, with, say, a rotation, rotational region. Um, so here I've linked to the um, best practices model that I, or best practices um, webinar that we spoke of before a few weeks ago. This that along with assigning um, just a free surface model. So at the bottom here, we've just got water entering, and it's gradually going to fill up and be moved around by this paddle as it rotates. Again, another point of note is that um, you might see that the water kind of vanishes as it falls off the paddle, um, and that's purely because we don't have enough mesh again. And the last slide, I thought I'd just show these um, because I guess how they kind of spawn. So this is looking more at free motion and um, the reaction of solids um, with the um, free surface and the body of water. So the bottom one can take a little while to run. I'm probably going to skip it on a tiny bit. So what we're doing is um, 
sending waves basically and pro propelling a ball essentially onto a beach. That's the idea. Okay, so that kind of takes me to, brings me to the end. It, uh, hopefully, I've covered everything that we would run through with the setup. Um, the main kind of problems, which essentially are making sure that we have enough mesh, and then giving you some ideas of the types of analyses that we can cover as well. So at that point, I'd like to open it up to you guys and ask if there's any questions. Hey, John, I've been responding to some questions here. Um, Rex, you just asked about the 2D ball and wave. That was a 2D planar model. So yes, free surface actually works really, really well in 2D because you can easily get the mesh in there that you need to do. So that was a, a 2D motion buoyancy of that ball moving through that wave. So that also responds to someone else's question earlier. Um, oh, it was actually Rex. Yeah, that, that was basically a sinusoidal input for the, for the wave motion there at the inlet. Okay, so you can do quite a lot. Um, if anybody has any applications they want us to think about and, and respond to live, uh, that'd be great. Great time now to add that in as a question, and we'll we'll try to respond to those. So, what happens with gravity if we have free surface and heat transfer? So, I'm guessing you're talking about buoyancy within the liquid. Then it it will respond according in terms of the density. Um, so, you know, that, that should work fine. You know, in reality, the gravity assigned to the free surface affects the, the, the free surface portion. You'd still need to assign the gravity for the heat transfer analyses. Those go to different portions within the code. So you'd still do both. That kind of raises an interesting point, actually, and one I didn't think of including, that um, generally we don't include... Um, hydrostatic fault is right. So if you know if we have a um, any kind of you know say weir analysis but we don't run free services, we're not going to take into account the the, the fluid and the pressure there. Um, but as soon as we turn on free surf then we would start to include those forces. So I see um, there's a question asking about um, how accurate the results are going to be considering they're not looking at surface tension. Um, it, it really depends on the, the type of analysis that you're running, I guess. I mean, if surface tension plays a massive part in the analysis, then you know the results aren't going to be as useful as they would be. Um, but most of the kind of analyses that we run aren't looking at um, surface tension as being a critical variable so you know it's generally okay you just have to be aware I guess of how you apply this yeah so where surface tension would come up is when you're looking more of like a fluidics microfluidics through small pipes and, and channels where that would be crucial but in terms of more of the like large system control, like the weirs, the flow going down um, uh, dams, well, I guess that's basically a weir, or sloshing inside of a tank, that, that's little effect uh, at, that, at that larger scale. Uh, in terms of accuracy, yeah, you, you, can, you can achieve decent drag values, um, you know, probably similar. You know, if you were to look at drag, Without free surface, you know, I, I've seen results from five to fifteen, twenty percent, and that's reasonable for those kind of applications. So, I'd probably say you're, you're going to get a little bit worse than that. Uh, how much? It's hard to really say. Is it time to see? Is it possible to see the time in the steps? Sorry, is it possible to see the time in the videos and not the steps? No, um, <laughs> but interestingly enough, that's something that I pretty sure we've put into the idea station, which if you've never seen that before, um, if you go into the forms, there is a, a section for idea station for all the different simulation products. 
So within here, there is a section in that um, talks about you know, plotting things based on time instead of iteration. So if, if you like that idea, come in here and, and give it a kudos or a like so that development knows that um, people want that. Um, I'm not sure of the, the last question. How do we simulate free surface with two fluids uh, with no contact between them? I guess it's kind of two questions. I mean, we couldn't simulate a free surface between two fluids. Um, I guess that's yeah. The if if, the, if there's no contact between them, then it's fine. You'd have one yeah, chamber with one fluid and another chamber with another fluid, and and that would be just just uh, that would work out okay. Um, so you basically follow the same workflow and just define the fluids as need be. In other words, the fluid does not need to be water. You know, normally we end up seeing water as the fluid, but it could be any any liquid that you like to use. Okay, that's all the questions that have come in so far. Uh, these are all really good questions, of course. Um, while we're waiting, I thought I would kind of jump in here, just because you know, we still have 20 minutes. But I thought I would show some of my model a little more, and then John can always show his too. And um, one thing I'm going to be looking to put out soon as well is a way to actually capture this sort of result information in sort of a workflow because this is also a request that comes in of how to plot the free surface over a given uh, profile. And I've, I've generated a workflow that, that does that and I'll, I'll share that within the apps uh, center um, in the future. But within the actual results, in terms of easily representing the free surface is something that John showed during the presentation. But you can come down, right click off the graphic window or off the model somewhere within the graphic window and just Your select it. Yep. I can't see your screen. I don't know if anybody else can. Sorry about that. Yeah, now I can. Okay. I thought I had shared that when I took the presentation back. So back to the simple model. Now just to show interaction between the model and the results, you know, if you want to see the free surface, you can right click and, and just go to free surface. And that will then generate a uh, kind of a filled isosurface view of that free surface. And there actually is some post-processing done here to make this surface look a little smoother. And it's one reason why um, there is that free surface option. So it, it does help uh, represent that free surface. When you're looking at these results in a large scale and and within the, the volume of fluid, you'll notice that the volume of fluid has a range of um, 0 to 1 within the results. And one thing I want to emphasize is that the volume of fl fluid theory only really defines a value of 0.5. Anything in between is just a gradient. So a lot of times when I look at these results, I will come in and um, actually remove the free surface. By the way, if you right click on the free surface, that's how you hide it. Okay. So normally what I do is I go to a solid mode, I go to options, and then I'll change this from 0.49 to 0.51. That way I, I zoom in right on the 0.5 value so I can look at that free surface uh, much cleaner within the model. So that's, that's my general workflow. Beyond that I'll then go to the free surface option to really uh, hone in on, on what's going on. Um, you also can come in and just put in a, a an isosurface and that will also uh, capture that free surface pretty cleanly. Any other questions come in, John?
No, not this time, there aren't. I was thinking of showing a similar thing on mine, but um, I'm not entirely sure how interesting it would be. <laughs> well, there we can. I guess what I will show is um, just taking a look at the mesh in a little bit more detail. So hopefully you can see that earlier works. Yep, I can see it. Cool. There's another question to urge on you. Yeah, yeah, so there was a question on um, um, yeah. seeing movement generate a tank by a helix. So I'm guessing the helix is just like a solid helix to do some mixing, which is turning at about 60 RPMs. There's an important number of blades related to the time step. So that helix, I'm guessing, probably be in a rotating region. Uh, you might actually want to do that as a motion setup instead of a rotating region. But either way, you know, that number of steps per blades is really more of a commentary on turbo machinery. So when you start looking at this mixing um, at that slow of an RPM, you'll probably end up seeing that the free surface time step will have a higher constraint than the, the time step based on the 60 RPM. Um, so it, for your application, that probably ends up being um, a minor point. Okay. okay so I thought... Um on my model, I could just take a look at the mesh a little bit. So this is, um, instead of just looking at free surface, this is ISO surface now. So same thing really as what Boris is showing. So it's just showing the, the top level um, of the free surface. And we can do is kind of drill in a little bit and just try and take a look at the mesh. Just turn the ISO surface off for a second. And it, really just to kind of, just to see um, how the mesh looks and um, where it could be improved, I guess. So, I mean, I, I would probably expect this jet to be more circular. Um, so, in a, even now, you know, I've got a pretty good mesh. I think if we refine this even further, we'd probably end up with a, a much kind of smoother result. I thought we could take a look um, across the wall as well, so where the fluid uh, is returning. If I turn the free surface on for a second. And we can see the wall down here. Um, and we can see really that the fluid should pass over the wall. And even though I've got a pretty good mesh, um, I still think possibly we could do with a little more around this region here. It would help us really properly capture the lower as the is at the top. There's a few more questions coming, Royce. I don't know if you are going to read. So just responding to a few more of the questions that come in. Additional boundary layers, uh, those really aren't needed for this type of, of approach. So a lot of the physics that we're using are the default, like the standard uh, K-Epsilon model and standard vection scheme one. And in that case, I pretty much always leave it at three layers. These models already take a long time to solve. So that, that's why. If we were starting to get into some of the um, you know, drag and wall force issues on, 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 on bluff bodies, like on, on vessels, then maybe we'd start looking at that. But I would definitely start with what we have as defaults first. I thought I'd share what I have here too. Just just to prove a point really, or to demonstrate a point, I guess, um, you know that I, I left this exactly as the default, so there's just three layers around every solid surface, um, all around the model, so wherever there's going to be fluid, and um, we've got a boundary layer ready to capture it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, distributed resistances do work with a free surface modeling and actually work uh, reasonably well.
and I'd probably stick with the free error ratio or the constant K than using a head capacity curve. I could see a head capacity curve approach um, being a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I think that's a very good comment. I'm not sure about the narrow pathways. Um, so somebody asked if you'd run flow through narrow pathways down to 150 micrometers. So if it's getting small enough that the surface tension and sort of the wicking effect that could result along the walls, then no, you know, because we're not going to be modeling that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's perfect. Okay. Does make sense. So there's a question here on flow in, or fuel injectors. You know, of course, that's going to be an autonomized uh, fuel going into um, your engine and looking at the mixing of the fluid and the air and, and things like that. And you might be able to get away with doing a standard uh, scalar mixing model and, and letting that leave the outlet. But really, it's probably more a qualitative sort of analysis. You know, I wouldn't want to say in any sense that you know, how accurate that really would be. Um, you know, there's much higher you know, physics required to do that sort of approach. That's probably the most requested enhancement, though, I guess, when it comes to free surfaces, surface tension, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and volume of fluid approach for free surface is not the right approach, in my understanding, for doing sprays. There's a different type of uh, technique that we would actually need to implement to make that work out. Okay, so a lot of people are starting to leave now. It's about five minutes to the hour. So at this point, I want to thank everybody for, for attending. If there's any future questions, I'd just like to encourage you to go into the forums uh, and then post that question there and we can re respond to it at that point. The recording for the video should be up on YouTube within a day or two. And again, the PowerPoint deck and some of the other information uh, from this presentation is all up in that link on autodesk.box.com slash CFD12. So you can download those and, and play around with those models so you can enjoy them on your own. Otherwise. Thanks again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you in about a month's time, where I will do, be doing a presentation on history of meshing and just sort of a, an open conversation on all the different settings that we have within the meshing tools within simulation CFD. So see you in a month, and have a great rest of your week.